Good morning. So good to be able to gather together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, like this. We're turning in our Bibles now to Psalm 121, which is part of what are known as the Songs of Ascent. These are 15 songs that are lined up together that help to describe how the Israelites are making their move from whether they be in captivity in Babylon and now their pilgrimage onward to Jerusalem, but also song of three particular festivals on their church calendar, such as Passover, where they might be coming, say, from Galilee and heading up the hills into the region of Jerusalem. Now, in order to fully understand how all these psalms fit together, I thought we would take a moment. I call this the line of ascent because these are songs of ascent. So if we could look at this, and what we find is that last week we began with Psalm 120. These 15 songs lead upwards to Psalm 134 where at that point, what we find is that the people gather together to experience and to express the blessing of God as they begin to think about how God protected them on the journey of their lives. What's also incredibly interesting, when you look at these 15 Psalms, which are meant to be understood together, they're very short, they are very succinct. They're meant to be memorized, children, parents, grandchildren, they would reflect upon these verses. And oftentimes they'd be sung back and forth in antiphony form. You also notice with me that um, the name Yahweh occurs 24 times uh, between Psalm 120 and the midpoint of Psalm 127. And again, Yahweh is mentioned 24 times, subsequent to leading up to Psalm 134. It's an incredibly well-structured, well-balanced collection of 15 psalms. They are meant to be understood in the idea of the journey of life, that you're on a pilgrimage, you're walking with the Lord, you're being guided by the Lord, and you want to equip the extended family to understand how God is guided and directed each step along the way. The midpoint in all this has to do with the family, the nuclear structure of Israel. And so we began last week, and if you've done uh, road trips, you are here. Psalm 121 is where you're at this morning, and I'd love to be able to explore this with you beginning now with this one after that superscription, uh, a song of a sense. The psalmist writes something that's extraordinarily uh, recognizable to all who have known Christ as their Lord and Savior and um, perhaps have read the Apostles' Creed where they see what's coming next. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven on earth. Now I want you to notice with me how many times the word keep is utilized in some variation, some form. He will not let your foot be moved, and he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And so this psalm has classically been recognized as the psalm pertaining to the keeper, which is what we're going to explore this morning as we now look to our Lord together in prayer. Father, there are so many extraordinary journeys of life to be told 
in this congregation of the prior service, of the ones gathered in this facility for this service, for those watching online at this very moment, those that will be watching online in the hours, days, weeks to come. As we look back over our journey thus far, what we want to do is to look for those significant points where we're able to say, my keeper was there. Maybe it was a tragedy. Maybe it was a significant loss. And yet out of it all, something new has been constructed. And the keeper of the past is the keeper of the present. And the keeper of the present is the keeper of the future. And that gives you a, such extraordinary assurance. There are those in our congregation that get weighed down by family members. What we need, Father, is to pray that that family member that perhaps is experiencing a difficult journey thus far in their life is being reintroduced to the idea that Yahweh, the Lord, is the keeper. He might not keep us from bad things, but he will keep us through bad things. Because we live in a fallen world. And while we can't always understand why things are the way they are, then we go to the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Three days later, you are Father, we're the keeper of the promise. You raised him from the grave. And so I want to talk this morning by your grace about this whole matter of how the basis for internal security is eternal security. Of what it means to be kept well. And we're kept by your grace if we put our faith and trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. So now like the prior service, for those watching online, for those in the facility at this moment, warm these hearts, engage these minds, shape these wills. As again, our Father, we've come here to see Jesus and him only, praying these things again now in Jesus' name, amen. Rabbi Eckstein, in his book, The Journey Home, describes a journey that he took to Israel in general, Jerusalem in particular, with Jamie Buckingham, a pastor, a rabbi and a pastor on a journey together. And Rabbi Eckstein writes in his conversation with, with Jamie Buckingham, Jamie, if I'm going too fast and the experiences of Israel are too compelling, I'm sorry, but to understand the Jewish people, you cannot sever their nexus to the history of this country. This land has molded the Jews into the people that they are. He tells us that Jamie was listening silently, gazing out the window as they made their way closer and closer to Jerusalem. We passed Hezitia, Israel's Silicon Valley. We passed Bab Evad, a dry vadi, a canal where many Jews died defending Jerusalem in 1948 and began our trek in third gear up to the Holy City. So what comes next? that roots me deeply in this particular psalm and the songs of ascent. 
Jamie, now you understand, now you'll see why the Hebrew word for moving to Israel, aliyah, means literally going up to ascend. As you can see, the road to Jerusalem is literally uplifting physically and spiritually. Many Jews died on this road trying to break through the Arab siege of Jerusalem in the 1948 War of Independence. Israeli convoys carrying food, water, and medicine tried to reach the besieged defenders of the city, which was surrounded by enemies perched on the heights above. Jamie, to this day, I, I can remember exactly where I was and how deeply a particular book affected me. The book, O Jerusalem, which described that 1948 battle. What grips my thought process at this point is the Hebrew word aliyah, which carries with the idea of the going up. This is why Jews talk about when they move to Israel, they are going up, you see. Which ties naturally into the songs of ascent that are described here. So what I want to do this morning is to explore with you the journey you're on. Because spiritually speaking, when you, are, when you are focused upon Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you're on the ascent. You are on the line of ascent. You are headed upward, so to speak. And what we want to do now is to draw out three significant provisions for your journey, my journey, that better equip us to handle the roads that we are traveling, be better prepared for the future we're facing. And the first comes out of verses 1 and verse 2. As the keeper of our lives, we want to note, first of all, that our Lord provides us with the needed help for life's journey. And I say that intentionally because it's a very powerful word that leaps out of the opening verses where the psalmist informs us, I lift up my eyes to the hills, but he's got this question that needs to be answered. From where does my help come? Now, what we have to bear in mind here is this. The city of Jerusalem initially constructed on three significant hills. So now he is using topography. At the same time, he is speaking metaphorically. When he asks the question, I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? Now, the family unit in Israel would be responsible for responding to the question that's being posed. Now, the hills surrounding Jerusalem would be extraordinarily threatening. You don't know who is about to attack you. And furthermore, not only is this a threatening situation, it is also a promised situation because this is the city of promise. It is the extraordinary shalom of life, Jerusalem, the city of peace. So now, bearing in mind what we stated a few moments ago, that the basis for internal security is our eternal security, in Christ Jesus, if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you now to metaphorically sp speaking, picture yourself on a, a journey, if you will. Maybe you've got family members with you, or maybe you're texting along the way. They want to know where you're at. I lift up my eyes to the hills, the hills in that time in which he wrote, 
There will be settings of both threat and promise simultaneously. From where does my help come? Not knowing what I might be facing in the midst of those hills. Generally speaking, the parent would pose this question, or the grandparent would pose this question on this journey. The child or the children then would respond. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Now notice he's personalized it at this point. And he's allowed then for the family unit to engage in this thing. Maybe you're texting. Maybe you're, you're involved with somebody who's struggling at this point. Where do I find help for the particular situation that I find myself in on this journey of life? What you're going to have to do is to get that person to lift their eyes above the hills. They might be engaged with horizontal living. What you're going to have to bring is the vertical dimension to life. The children are well trained. Their response in verse 2 to the parents' question in verse 1, my help comes not from the hills. My help comes from the Lord. Hebrew word Yahweh, capitalized, capital L-O-R-D. My help comes from the Lord. And then this very powerful addition. Who made heaven and earth. Remember the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. Now, how do you take what is creational and simultaneously make this practical? Neil Armstrong, great astronaut, once took a trip to the old city of Jerusalem. If you've been there, you know the area that I'm speaking of when I say he went to the Hoda Gate, which opens to the Temple Mount. Neil Armstrong asked a guide whether Jesus had, in fact, walked that same path. Armstrong evidently was struggling at that point with where he was at in life. The guide responded that Christ had walked that path. And when he told that Christ had, Armstrong humbly replied, quote, I have to tell you, I am more excited about stepping on these stones of Jerusalem than I was stepping on the moon. What he's done at this point is taken what I will call the creational and made it practical. Because life is a journey and life involves one step after another, taking us into hill countries that, well, very frankly, we don't know what might be there out there in the hills or what your children or grandchildren might be facing. But you have to lift your eyes above the hills and focus upon the one who is the creator of the hills. And so here now is a creational aspect being brought into the faith element of the daily walk in our relationship to Jesus Christ. So now I say to myself, okay, I'm going to have to get beyond the horizontal approach to mapping out my journey of life. I'm going to have to get vertical. I'm going to have to recognize the hills, evaluate the hills, study the hills. But simultaneously, I'm going to have to stay focused upon the creator of the hills. The hills of Jerusalem. Look what comes next. It appears on the screen because when you and I are walking and we are making our way into Jerusalem, what amazes us is the topography 
On one side, to your left, you can see shepherds. I'm always amazed that there are shepherds tending sheep in such extraordinarily arid conditions, always looking for green pastures because it's a very arid setting. Notice the hills to your right. I'm, I'm told, and I've spent time talking with people who have worked in the hospitals that are tied to Israel in general, and Jerusalem in particular, and if you want to find out what happens primarily in the ER, it's broken ankles, sprained ankles, anything pertaining to the lower extremities of the body, and you can see why. Look at the terrain. Now, it could very well be that the terrain of your life looks extraordinarily difficult to travel, to climb, if you just simply stay horizontal and not take into account the one who oversees all things vertical. You'll miss out on how God is guiding you each and every step along the way. You need to have the sum total of both horizontal and vertical simultaneously in the way in which you approach the tomorrows of your life on your life's journey. So if you have somebody in your extended family or among your friends who feel as though the terrain is too difficult, chances are they are highly horizontal. They have not gotten vertical and brought both dimensions together. The psalmist has. Horizontally, I lift up my eyes to the hills, but now the question, from where does my help come? The react response, verse 2. My help comes from the Lord, but don't stop there. Allow for the creational to shape the practical, who made heaven and earth, and therefore he is the one who is sovereign over my journey. You see? Now, once you begin to map that out, you can better understand why I knew I'm strong and pull such thoughts together and be able to understand that there's a sovereign God looking out, watching over, keeping, keeping his people. You're on to the a second provision. Because not only do we find here that God is at work and God is meeting the needs and God is providing uh, the needed help for life's journey in verses 1 and 2, but furthermore, the needed guidance for life's journey in verses 3 through 6. Somehow, we're going to have to get beyond the you are here to where you'll be. And now, look at this assurance. He shifts into future tense. He will not let your foot be moved. For all those that have sprained their ankles and are right now in the ER in Jerusalem. He who keeps you will not slumber Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And I thought about that because your mind goes back to that incredible story in 1 Kings chapter 18. Ahab is in a highly secularized setting in the northern portions of Israel. <coughs> they have chosen these people an alternative to Yahweh, our sovereign Lord. Baal, the false god, has been imported into, into the landscape of Israel. Now there's false, false prophets on the scene, and Elijah stands alone, and he's pitted against them. So there's this there's this tension, there is this conflict that begins to unfold. Elijah takes them on. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull, prepare it first, for you're many. Call upon the name of your God, 
but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal. Now, notice how intense they were. From morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. We're told they limped around the altar that they had made, and at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he's a god. Either he, either he is musing, or he's relieving himself. Man, he's got away with words. Or he's on a journey. Or perhaps... He's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and nothing happened. You know the rest of the story. God had that altar saturated with water. He brought fire down and consumed the sacrifice. He was not asleep. And on your journey, your Lord is wide awake. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. You see, in ancient times, whether it be in Roman mythology or Greek mythology, the Romans and the Greeks allowed for their false gods to sleep. So they were better prepared to take care of uh, the Romans and the Greeks in their journeys. What the psalmist is telling us is that your Lord is on 24-7. Even through the most extreme portions of life, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And he shifts from the personal, your foot, to the national, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. God was on duty in the spring of 1982. When John Schneider tells us that I attended a morning prayer group which meets in a town within the suburbs of Springfield, Illinois, I was the speaker. But before I spoke, a neighboring pastor shared from his recent trip to Mexico. He, along with several others, had gone there uh, to share the gospel. And while they were returning, their van developed mechanical problems. After jacking up the van, the pastor crawled under to check out the problem. And just then, the jack collapsed. And he suddenly felt the crushing force upon his chest. Now his companions quickly grabbed the bumper to lift the van, and they were not able to so much as budge it. He cried out, Jesus, Jesus, what comes next? Within a few seconds, a youthful-looking Mexican came running toward them. He was thin, small in stature, smiling. As he reached the van, he grabbed the bumper and lifted it. And the others also joined him and said that it went up like a feather. As he was freed, the pastor said he felt his chest expand and the broken bones mend. The visitor then lowered the van, waved to them, ran in the direction from which he came until he disappeared on the horizon. And then the people turned to one and asked, was that an angel? What just happened? And someone responded, that's the keeper at work. Now, we don't always know the whys 
and the winds and the whiz regarding the way in which the keeper works. Sometimes it's this side of heaven. Other times, perfection, other side of heaven. But the extremes of life when we are confronted with on the, on the journey of life are such that we have to keep our eyes open and move beyond the hills and be able to spot the one who's the keeper of the hills, who's guiding and directing the journey of life. And maybe you've got some loved ones that need to be able to apply Psalm 121 to their lives. Because now what he does, he continues to emphasize this idea, doesn't he? Because he moves into verse 5 and onward into verse 6. The Lord is your keeper. Now he applies it to others as well. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the noon, you see, by night. And God is at work. And he will do things that you nor I will fully expect or fully understand because we might not know the reasons why at the moment as to why we're going through what we're going through. And it's further on down the road that somebody else will hear the gospel because of the story that you tell about the experience of your life. Tom Hawks in hand, the Indians crept toward the tent. And as they peered under the flap, their intention was to kill the man inside. And there in the center of the tent, this man was found on his knees, praying. They watched. A rattlesnake crossed his feet, paused in position to strike. It was the 1700s. The snake did not strike. It lowered its head, glided out the tent. It was a long time later when David Brainerd, the man in the tent, found out why the Indians at the village received him with such honor as they did. They had wanted to kill him. And the reason for their change of heart was the report that uh, their colleagues, their friends, their comrades had brought of the incredibly marvelous thing they had seen. The Indians looked upon David Brainerd with a, as a messenger from the great spirit in their estimation. <laughs> There's a sense where he was. In all good work, the protection of God is with the worker. But what we have to bear in mind at this point is that the keeper has unique ways of taking the work of the present and applying it to the witness of the future. What you have gone through yesterday is meant to be a witness for today and tomorrow. He's your keeper. And the keeper of our lives, our Lord, he provides us with the needed help for life's journey. You see it in verses 1 and 2. But furthermore, the needed guidance for life's journey in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6. But thirdly, the needed assurance for life's journey in verses 7 and 8. Where now the psalmist, as he, as he engages those on this pilgrimage, and they're getting closer and closer and closer to Jerusalem, says, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. And for the Jew at this point, this resonates. Because the great ironic benediction of Numbers chapter 6 leaps out in the midst of all this, the Lord bless you and what? Keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. As these individuals are making their way to Jerusalem, you see, the Lord will keep you from all evil. They're to sing this. He will keep your life. 
the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And you see the going out and your coming in? That has to do with your here and wherever, while this time forth and forevermore has to do with your now and your forever. What God does in his keeping then is he deals with your wherevers and combines them with your whenevers you are kept in his grace. And the basis for your internal security is eternal security in a relationship with God through the finished work of Christ on the cross. One night, as Billy Graham's associates, Howard and Clarence Jones, were driving along in a blizzard Suddenly, Clarence felt compelled, we're told, to stop the car in the middle of the highway. The next moment, scarcely six feet in front of their stopped vehicle, like a ghost in the silent witnesses, a train swooshed past. And the astonished pair, again, could only praise God for his unmistakable guidance, the unfailing what they called divine radar, quote unquote, and praise God, the keeper. No matter what you've gone through in life, he might not have kept you from something. He does keep you through the something. And he's got you forever. Let's stand together. And I praise you and I thank you, Father. We live in a fallen world. Things go wrong. But in a culture that's highly horizontal, The believer has got an added dimension to bring to life the vertical. And we talk about and we think about how the sinless one entered into the sinful realm to die for our sins, to set us free. And you kept the promise. And three days later, he was raised from the grave. You're the keeper. So may we now take these six statements of keeping in these eight verses, apply them to the journey of our life, and use them in a way that ministers to the point of need, and we will give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.